you came over, um, you guys had a look at your team and, and it was an experienced team. Um, it was a well-balanced team. You had a, a great blend of, of good players, experienced players and players that have played together for what seemed to us like a long time where we were sort of thrown together and um, we had a, a few changes um, throughout the tour but um, you guys played some really, really good cricket. Um, that, that first test up in Brisbane got the upper hand and momentum just seemed to go with you. Um, Mike, but on the on the other side of that same coin, um, you, for instance, as captain, had never toured Australia before. Um, we had possibly the worst month ever of uh, <laughs> approaching the first test match that uh, any England team had experienced on tour down under. Yeah, we did. I mean, you know, when, when Merv talks about it, uh, inexperience, I mean, when you think of someone like Daffy, I mean, Jess hadn't played much test cricket. Um, Bill Athey hadn't played much test cricket and uh, you know Gladstone, Fozzie uh, the one thing we did have though was a, a three three uh, sort of stalwarts in yourself, Lammy, Gower and also the two spinners and I think the two spinners were the, the guys that sort of you know gave us control when we needed it and I think they did a great job and they don't get enough praise for it and you had someone like Dill who, who bowled well and, and obviously uh, the old guard so I was I was very very comfortable with what we had. Um, I just couldn't believe how badly we started. I really couldn't with with the with the sort of you know the, the people we had on board and and the quality that was was there. I suppose it just needed something to ignite it to get it to to to, to mould together. Um, and I'm not quite sure when that happened. Whether it was that team talk that BV gave us just before the uh, first test at Brisbane. Right. Let's come back to that in a moment, um, Chris, otherwise known as Jess, as Mike just called you there. Um, and and you, you did. To, you don't have to explain why. Um, ask you why. I'm sure you will at some stage. <laughs> um, yeah, but how, when when you when you arrived on that tour, what were your expectations? Uh, do you know? I mean, it, it was my first tour. Uh, you you're right. I played for England in '84 and then got left out. There was a horses for courses policy at that time amongst selectors. Uh, and it was, uh, it, you know, I was just, I think it was every English cricketer's dream to get selected to play for Australia and uh, against Australia, in Australia. Uh, and for me, it was just, uh, I, I didn't think too much about the tour. I was just excited about uh, meeting up with you guys at Heathrow and then travelling and uh, and then getting to Australia and uh, and then just enjoying what basically what we were told to do because I had no preconceived ideas of, of what touring was about. It was just, okay, what am I told to do? Let's go, crack on and do it. And, you know, arriving in Brisbane and, and going out on the golf course straight away, not being allowed to sleep and then, and then trying to catch up with jet lag as quickly as possible. And then the game started. And, and um, I mean, that, I didn't, as I say, I didn't have any preconceived ideas of what the tour was about. It was just fortunate that, um, uh, you know, I think Gat mentioned Beefy's speech. For me, that was when the tour really started. Uh, again, I'll come back to that because that's just yeah. for the Brisbane Test Match. Because Glad, um, I would describe Gladstone Small as a natural tourist. <laughs> I, I, and I still would, is yeah. And, yeah, and there's a lot of nodding going on amongst the, the panel here today everyone, everyone seems to subscribe to that, that opinion Glad that first week or two in, well the first week in Brisbane talk us through that well hi guys great to see everyone and I don't, before we get there I must remember it actually I'd, I'd forgotten about the, the announcement of the team quite frankly obviously the back then the season finished and I actually was out playing golf that afternoon at Edgbaston, Edgbaston Golf Club. And I got home, got back home, and my, my fiancé at the time, who was actually an Australian girl, she subsequently became my wife, Lois. And she said, she said, oh, Gatton's been on the phone for you. And I said, what does he want? I, I totally feeding. It's, not, it's normally feeding. <laughs> I thought I'd forgotten about what this this cricket. Oh, hang on, enter stage left. Oh, here we go, oh, dear. We must be back. <laughs> Cheers, gentlemen. Yeah. So this, <laughs> this, this, this is this is all. This is now entirely reminiscent of that first. <laughs> <laughs> but but actually, that's quite timely because I remember that that trip. Actually, traveling down to Australia on the British Airways flight, whatever it was, 
And, and when we got to Singapore, they ran out of booze. They had to restock the booze, the, the, the booze at that Singapore because of a certain Oranda who only allowed us, he can only sleep when he was asleep. And so by the time we got to Australia, I must admit we were a little bit worse for wear. And it, we carried out wear for the first month of the tour, quite frankly. But the hey, excitement, I mean, the excitement from, as a young guy who, as Rodney just said, having not toured before, obviously he'd heard about Australia. I'd played cricket uh, back in the early 80s. I'd played in Melbourne with the likes of, of Merv and Dean Jones and, and, these, and these sort of guys. So that was you know, great, to, great looking forward to Lock Horns and yeah. some Low Pals Day as well. I mean, the preparation for this tour, I mean, the, the itinerary, unfortunately, seemed to take us, after that first week in Brisbane, netting in that lovely, lovely city, we had, had to go to Bundaberg, didn't we? Um, <laughs> which is up the coast. It's basically sugar farming, and they make something called rum up there as well, the Bundy. Um, so our first experience of you know, cricket in Australia on that tour was at the Salter Oval, up in Bundaberg. Merv, have you been up there? Uh, yes, I have. You had a drink? Uh, um... Uh, to, to be quite honest, I, I have two strict rules in life. Uh, number one is SBA, which is strictly beer only. So I, I tend to tend to steer away from Bundy. And the other one is uh, DFD, which is don't dance. Um, so if you lose the first one, the second one's out the window. So I'll try and stick with the first one. But uh, obviously Bundy, Bund Bundaberg rum, um, it's an iconic Australian drink that most Queenslanders drink. Um, and in Victoria, we don't go near it. Very sensible. I say that because um, the night before the game up there, but I'm, I'm only going to tell the story because I know that Gladstone or Gat or Jess would go straight into this if I don't tell it. But the night before the game, we had a, an, an official function at the Oval, at Salter Oval with uh, long speeches, poems, you name it. And Beefy and I decided that the best way to get through this was to have a little, little sample of the, the local produce. Uh, now, everyone who knows Ian, knows Beefy, knows that he has a certain pace that he drinks at. And if you've got rules, Merv, I can tell you the one rule I should have remembered that night is drink at my pace, not at Beefy's pace. Um, yes. so basically, there was a, uh, a body taken out of the Salter Oval as the bus left there at the end of the function. Uh, Beefy was, of course, absolutely fine. Um, I think he and Lammy stuffed me under a shower in my room at approximately midnight and just left me there to see if I was okay in the morning. And Gat, as captain, I remember you and the management had to have a serious word in the morning at eight o'clock on the dot about tour discipline. Because um, all your great speeches about this is where we start, this is where we, you know, we set the tone, we, you know, we carry on as we mean to go on here from, from this game onwards, seem to have gone literally out the window that night before, out the back of the bus. Indeed. <laughs> Out the back of the bus being the word. <laughs> Chunder everywhere. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, So, yeah, tour discipline. Talk me through the tour discipline. The tour discipline was, was very simple. Um, you, you, Lammy and Beefy, go and drink, but don't take the youngsters with you. And I remember, remember saying that to Philip Nefratis first up, and I remember we put him to share with Beefy to get used to the big, big fella. And um, I said to said to Beefy, I said, look, you know, just have a look after the youngsters on the first month of the tour, but, you know, in the nets and, and looking after them and making sure that, that, that they're doing the right thing and talk to them about playing cricket in Australia, etc. Uh, and I said to Daffy, I said, Daffy, Beefy's likely to come back rather late one night, possibly, and he'll probably offer you a couple of large something or others. And if you drink those something or others, I, I suggest you might well be... Something else from you, <laughs> you might well be on the first plane home, but, but not even get a game of cricket. And so I said, just say no to him and it'll be fine. And uh, sure as eggs are eggs, Beefy came in and offered, offered Daffy a drink. And, and Daffy actually said, Beefy said, look, Gat said to me, you might, you might do this. And he said, I've got to say no. So um, I'm saying no. And to be fair to Beefy, he actually left them there and they were still in the, there in the morning. So, um, which is unusual for Beefy, but... You know, that was, uh, I thought, very good on his part and also very good on, on Daffy's part. And I think, you know, that was the nice thing about it. You know, he realised that this was a young lad who who, uh, who really wanted to do do well. And, um, yeah, it, it kept everything together. So Beefy had a big part to play, certainly in that first month, with the guys in the nets, especially the young guys, just talking them through 
what the Aussies were like and what it was like over here. And I think he, he did a great job. And then after that, Beefy was given a free free reign to, uh, to, to, to do what he wanted, really. Yeah, he was, he was, and, he was always, always better free range. Yeah, um, as were you. <laughs> indeed, yes, I can't deny that. Um, just for, from your point of view, though, I mean, we, we all know, looking back on this, and we've, we've sort of kind of reminded ourselves yesterday, we all know that that first month went not very well. Um, we didn't play very well in the warm-up games. Um, Jess, what was your what was your sort of feeling about how it was going at that stage? Um, you're right. What you say is, you know, personally, you look at your form and and you know that those games were there for you to score runs or for me to score runs to force my way into the into the test team. That the openers slot was between myself, Bill Athy, and Wilf Slack, um, and none of us really. Uh, scored runs and and uh, and it was it was one of those toss ups I suppose at the uh, start I don't know Gap could probably answer this because he obviously in selection but it was one of those toss ups at the start of the tour in, in Brisbane you know what's going to be your opening partnership and I guess they were looking at a left and right hander and that meant presumably me or Will Slack along with Bill Athey and I suppose I'd had slightly the better of it in the pre-season, in the pre-match uh, games than the other two, but I was by no means certain of what was going on. And I mean, you know, some of the things that happened during the games that our senior players uh, went missing sometimes. Um, well, you know, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Freeman <laughs> and certain uh, moments. But um, no, listen, it was... I was just enjoying uh, traveling around Australia with a group of English guys and uh, and looking forward to to playing uh, international cricket again. Uh, Gladys, from your point of view, again trying to force your way into the team. We've got we've got various questions that will come in at various stages through this hour. Um, one that we prepared earlier comes from a guy called John Adams. John, hi to you, um, and he's highlighted you because he says. Gladstone, talk us through opening the batting against West Australia and scoring more runs in one innings than D.I. Gower in two. Talk us through batting against New South Wales and scoring more runs in one innings than D.I. Gower in two. And just remind us about your marvellous MOM at the MCG. We'll come back to the MCG at the moment. Were you seriously trying to get into the side as a batsman? <laughs> hey, in the state anywhere you could at that, that, that stage. <laughs> but, I mean, and actually, it just highlights that, that tour, 86. We had a month in Australia before the, prior to the first test match. And for a youngster like me, you know, it gives you the opportunity to one, to, to try and make your mark and impress, to impress the likes of playing in the game with, with the likes of, you know, yourself and, and, and Gat and, and Botham and these sort of guys. You want, you want to impress, you want, you want to impress. But the thing about Australia, you mentioned playing in Perth. We started off, that would be said, Bundaberg within the first week. And then we travelled down through New South Wales, and I think we went to Victoria. Um, and or everyone who knows the other will know Australia is not a small, not a small country. And so that the Aussies, in their wisdom, they tra tra trap us all over the place. And then we were back to back to Brisbane for the first Test match. So, so what you you do get a chance as a as a young guy, mm. you know, back then, you you know, mm. to really try and you know make try and. Yeah, you know, I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be in the first 11 um, mm -hmm. that tour. But also, Gap up in his team tour, you know, we knew the 11, who they were in those first test matches. But he always finished up the meeting saying, right, guys, you know, you know that has still got another 10, 12 hours to go before the toss the coin. So just make sure you prepare, you might prepare for the tap on the show. Uh, and that's exactly what happened at the MCG. Yeah. Boxing Day. Oh, yeah, because, of course, that sort of thing, yeah, that's the thing that every captain, every manager has to say at every team meeting the night before the game starts the following day. And I only remember once uh, on, a, on, a thing, on the following tour, actually, 1991, coming out of the, you know, arriving in the lobby of the, the hotel in Adelaide, test match about to start in a couple of hours' time, and the cat, Phil Tufnell, was on his way in from the casino. We hadn't quite <laughs> got the hang of this. Really. Obviously, the time difference thing was still confusing him at that stage. Um, and there was a lot going on. I mean, you, mentioned, you mentioned Perth there. Uh, I'm just remembering that this is obviously a serious talk about the 86, 87 Ashes. But it's also about travel. It's also about Australia. 
It's also about a place that we might get to in a couple of winters time, if we're very lucky, again with Black Opal for the next Ashes series. And Perth, if you remember the game down there, where obviously Gladstone, you got more runs than me in one innings than I got in two. Um, but that's where both of them struck again, wasn't it? Because we had the America's Cup going on off the waters of Perth while we were there, um, with Harold Cudmore, the White Horse Challenge, the English Boat. And I remember both from Gower and Lamb, usual suspects, got invited down to Fremantle for a quiet night out, which went slightly beyond, um, beyond the limit. I remember, I mean, Beefy, Beefy got into his big white limo to go home. Lamb and I had to hitch a lift. Um, the two of them decided there was a minibar still hadn't been emptied or two. And <coughs> hands up if anyone has ever heard Beefy admit to a hangover. Not anyone? very often. No, never. No, one, of, one of his rules, a bit like Murs, one of his rules is never admit to a hangover. But following morning, if you remember, he didn't come out to train. As far as I record, he sort of spent most of, it, most of the morning between arriving at the ground and play starting with England batting, plunging his head into a basin full of ice water. Um, Gat, we probably had to slip him down the order, I think, didn't we? <laughs> we might well have done, I think, yes, on that particular occasion. And... Um, Someone must have put pads on his legs, handed him gloves and stuff, and we pushed him out the door. And he got all the way out to the crease, welcomed by the entire WA team, who knew exactly what had happened the night before. And everyone realised he hadn't got a bat with him. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then proceeded to go and get 50. And get you were 80. You were 80 and about oh. 60 balls. Yeah, that's right. It was yeah. extraordinary. Came back in. Finally, for the first time of that day, he could actually speak. Um, having plunged his head back into the ice water again. When questioned, apparently said, um, how did you do that? And he said, well, I've seen three, so I just took the middle one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, those, those are the sort of things that count as sort of incidental problems on a tour of Australia. If we go well, back... No, to, to, be, to be honest, you did yeah. a fantastic job because you got written off as a team to be the worst team to ever be selected to tour, tour Australia. And in those early games, you didn't disappoint, did you? So I think, <laughs> I think the strategy from the England team was fantastic. It was just play beneath yourself here, fellas. We'll, we'll give these Aussies a, a world of hope and then we'll just rip their hearts out in the first test match. And you did that very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the comments, the famous infamous comments from the newspapers was a, an old friend of mine who used to work in Leicester and the Leicester Mercury, then went to the national newspapers, Martin Johnson who summed it up by saying there are only three things this England team cannot do, they cannot bat, they cannot bowl, they cannot feel. So the moment he wrote that, which was probably in the last couple of days before the start of that first test match in Brisbane, the moment he said that, things all changed around. Actually, at the end of it all, um, he rewrote, he said, got to rewrite this, he said, right quote, wrong team. But um, Michael you've, and Jess, you've referred to that team talk, Beef is team talk in Brisbane. Talk us through that. Go on, Jess. I remember, you know, in those days, we all used to gather prior to the first day of a test match, both home and away, and have a team meal. And in the hotel, there was a big team room, which uh, was set out, laid out uh, in a square. Um, and we were all enjoying a nice meal in the hotel. And then it came to, uh, you know, some chat. And with all that's been discussed before about what had gone on on the tour, um, we were thinking, okay, well, how are we going to try and assess this first test match and make, make the test match work in our favour? Then Beefy got up, awful lot of swear words, can't, can't mention uh, too much of what he said, but uh, he, all of a sudden you thought, this bloke is now serious about cricket and for me, that was, the, that was the definitive moment in the tour where I, I looked at the senior players and if Beefy's saying this, then it must be the, the norm for senior players to enjoy Australia, who have been there before. Uh, and then now this is Test cricket. This is where we focus. And, and of course, the following couple of days where Beefy gets 100, Lubo gets 50, Lammy gets some runs. Uh, Edmonds and Embry bowl really well. You know, it proved the point that the senior players came came to uh, the party and started playing to the highest level. And, and that proved to me that this is what 
t uh, touring is all about. You have a little bit of fun, you acclimatize, you get to know everyone in the spirit that you're meant to. But when it comes to test cricket, th that is the important thing. And, uh, and so it proved on this occasion. Uh, Gat, yes. I mean, we got a question here. Hey, Oh, yes, sorry, sorry, no, on, sorry, sorry Jeff, I, I just wanted to throw a question at, at Mr. Gadding, if I could. Um, as, a, as a captain of the side coming to Australia at that time, being written off as a, the worst team, how did you feel about it? Because oh, I had a look at your side, and you're a lot more experienced than us. You were more settled. Um, and from an Australian's point of view, it was playing, yes, it was playing the arch enemy, but you just seemed to have... To, to me, a, a stronger side. And I suppose having lost a lot of players to that Rebel Tour for us only 12 months earlier, we were in a bit of a rebuilding phase. When when you talk about Edmonds and Embry, yourself, getting Beefy, you had the basis of a really good side. So how were you feeling as a captain? I was feeling a little bit sort of confused as to why we hadn't played perhaps as well as we should have been. Because I, I felt when I Team and yeah, we had a couple of you know, people that uh, were, were going to play big parts, obviously, at some stage. And if they did, then we had a really good chance, like David, like Beefy, and, and like the two spinners. Um, and I, I just felt that, you know, we, we, we were up front was where we were, we were, we were been really struggling. And I felt that if we could get up front right, then I thought we had a really good chance. Because Dill, people forget, you know, Dill, Daffy, Beefy... Gladstone and Fozzie were the two heat. really decent no. backup. I mean, they really were for, 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 what, for, what, for what sort of wickets and what you needed to do. So I was still scratching my head thinking, you know, what, why are we playing so badly? But I think Jess, Jess described it so much more nicely uh, than I would have done about the team talk. But it's, he basically said, look, we've been, we played like crap. Um, that's just been practice. And this is, this is quite edited as well. Um, there's going to be 11 of us out of there tomorrow and 11 of them. And basically, if we if we play like we can, we're going to beat them. Sat down. So I had my speech. Mickey had his speech. I think Mickey said a few words after, but there was nothing more you could say. And as Jess rightly said, that the the the, the 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 sort of way Beefy said it, uh, and the respect he had from the the guys in there, I think it 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 was so different to his normal team talk of about I'll bounce him out, I'll bowl him an in swinger, then an out swinger, and I'll knock him over and. Then I'll smash it around. It, you know, some of those team talks that we've heard before, this was, this was almost like there was real feeling in it and, and real sort of depth of, of I really want to win out here, fellas. Um, and I think that was possibly, for me, just the, the catalyst for us guys who, who were sort of perceived as outside the, the sort of Lamb, Botham, Gower, um, sort of what I'd say hub they were going to be the hub. And, uh, you know, we, we had to make sure we did our bits too. Yeah, we've got questions here. Keith Williams, um, who is the chairman of the East Midlands Committee of Lords Tabners. Keith was asking about, actually he was asking about that night in Fremantle with Beefy, how drunk was he? Incredible. <laughs> very, um, very. Asking Gas actually about um, that comment, the can't back, can't, can't bowl, can't field. You know, do you use that to try and motivate a team? And you've almost answered that already anyway. And there's more for Merv and Gladys later. We'll come back to that as well. But if you look at that first day of, the of that first test in Brisbane, then uh, England batting first, BC Broad, uh, not his finest hour. Bill Athey, 70 odd. Mike Gatting, 61. Alan Lamb, 40. Di Garrett, five. Uh, got dropped early in the slips. Oh. Um, Chris, oh, Matthews. Chris, oh, Chris Matthews. Chris Matthews. What was what Chris was Matthews doing, doing at third slip? <laughs> That's what we said. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm, obviously, Alan Border didn't think I was going to get an edge, did he? Fair dinkum. Is that off you, oh. mate? Oh, you just sit there, well, like you get the edge, and you think happy days, Chris. But what's Chris Matthews doing in slip? Like that's like having me in slip. Waste of time, waste of space. But anyway, I think you'll drop on it. Very early, if I remember, might, he might not have even been off the mark. Um, uh, yeah, I think he got go. off the mark, Merv, but it went very, very quickly. I have to say, it was one of David's bit, be, better flashes. Uh, <laughs> but then, then it was a, a fantastic, fantastic partnership by um, yourself and, and Beefy, and almost got into the Guinness Book of Records that day, if you remember. Mm -hmm. I went for 22 off a six ball over, 
and the record was, I think, 26 in a test match off an eight ball over. So I was really? right. If I was still playing eight ball overs, I would have been in there. That was the uh, that was the second new ball, wasn't it? Second new ball, yeah. Oh, overrated. Overrated the second new ball, isn't it? Interesting you mentioned about that five because I recall that that morning, that first morning at Brisbane, doing my job as in, I'm not in the team, so I'm I'm mixing the drinks, you know, making sure everyone had their drink, the drinks bottle all prepared. And Brody and, and Bill Affey strode out over the old, remember the old Gabba had the old yeah, dog, dog the dog track. Dress room, there was no one, there was none, no other English of our batsmen padded up. So I'm thinking, crikey, geez, what's going on here? And then, and then, you know, Gap, Gap, the skipper to his credit says, yeah, right, that's it. I'll bat three then. <laughs> it wasn't quite as simple as that, Stone. You had to go and locate Mr. Gow, who was who was uh, pontificating on the on the porcelain. I was I was visualising, and, and I, I just felt that uh, something said to me, you know, let's try and change this around a bit. Just try and do something different. And uh, I said, David, do you mind if I go in three and you go five? And as David, good team man, said no problem. So I I was a little bit late getting my pads on, but I was hoping he was going to say yes. So. I thought that was the best thing to do at the time, and 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 so I did it. That's all, and it, well, and it was, you know, it was a pretty even. Like you have a look at that card, the top, the top six, top seven batsmen. Um, yep. It was a pretty, a pretty even card, wasn't it? Apart yep. from, apart from Broad, who let you down miserably. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but he he did repay the faith. <laughs> he certainly did. He certainly got going. So yes, okay. Hey, let's, let's remember we have only. So much time today, but um, yeah, you were 35 not out at the end of that second innings. Uh, along yeah. with Philip Gower is 15 not out. Uh, probably gave three chances in that 15. <laughs> but you survived. Um, how important was that to you, just to get a bit of confidence at the end of that game? To be honest, huge. Uh, as has been pointed out on by numerous uh, uh, people already, uh, I failed in the first innings. So to have failed in the second innings would have meant that my uh, place would have been very much in jeopardy for the second test and remainder of the series. Uh, and I remember edging a ball fairly early on uh, to Steve War at uh, third slip, and it was quite a straightforward catch, and he put it down. Only two or three overs later, to take an absolute blinder off Bill Athey, mm. uh, one-handed. And had Steve taken that fairly easy catch off me, I would have had two low scores. In fact, then I ended up not out 35. We won the game, and I felt it gave me, a, again, a, another sort of confidence booster. It's amazing the little things that give you confidence boosters throughout matches and series. And that, for me, you know, the, the both of them chat and the, and the drop in the, a third slip, for me, was, was a real confidence booster. Well, it obviously yeah. worked because following innings or the following test match, uh, which is Perth, second test match, BC Broad opens the innings, 162. Oh. Yeah, that was Merv, flat, though, Merv, wasn't it? Merv, that was Merv, flat, wicked, Merv. Well, Merv wasn't there. Well, to be, to be honest, they said, we've got to get this left hand in form. You have a rest this test match, and we'll see if we can get him into, into form. Uh, no, I, I, I got dropped up. Like, I, I thought I had reasonable figures. I, five five of the 13 wickets that fell in the test match at, at Brisbane, I think. And, um, Two, yeah. Yeah, just, I, I, got, I, got, I got dropped. But the, the, stu well, the funny thing, the stupid thing about it, Victoria played Queensland, and we bowled for two days at Queensland. And Jim Higgs, who was a selector, came up. The side's getting picked this afternoon, um, and I had a bit of a hamstring strain. We need you to do a fitness test. So, all right, so I uh, go to the nets, uh, bowl for an hour and a half, as you used to do in those days, got through it all, and then he told me that um, I wasn't selected. <laughs> Thanks. I said, well, Jesus. Why, why the hell did I do the fitness test? Oh, we just wanted to see if you are fit. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking this. I was only a young bloke now. It didn't make sense to me then, and even now it didn't. It doesn't make sense to me, to be honest. But yeah, that that first te test match, um, Chris Matthews um, played. Um, yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of wickets taken over there, was there? 
No, no, it was flat. It was a. It was flat. flat. Yeah. Three, three, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Flat. Oh, well, I was doing it a little bit early, so you get through that first hour. Obviously, was important, Chris, wasn't it? I'm not sure it was doing anything early. I mean, it was. I'm trying to help you here, mate. <laughs> it was. Beaming all over the place. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was like like an upturned saucer as well. As soon as yeah. you. Go, infield it ran away to the boundary and uh yeah, yeah i mean it was uh, aside from trembridge which is always going to be my favorite place to play cricket i think perth is one of the the favorites for me because it was just such a wonderful batting track in those days and and remains a, a good batting track now and it's a it's a shame that it's they've moved to a new stadium of course yes right? that is over yeah. the road in burswood but um the wacker will always be a very a memorable place for me well, so Wacker used to be regarded as being one of the fastest tracks in world cricket. Yeah. But the previous year, or two years before that, I think they, they changed the angle of the of the pitch 15 degrees. I remember speaking to Dennis Lilly about it because back in the day, you have the old doctor. The doctor would be right up his right up his, yeah. his, his, his backside. But by, by changing the 15 degrees, it was at a bit of an angle. So it actually changed up the dynamics of the of the Wacker pitch. That, that little, no. and it turned out to be quite flat. And, and of course, a newly laid wicket is always going to be a little bit slow. It takes a, a long yeah. time to settle. Um, so while it was true in bounds, um, it was true in pace, but it didn't have that real pace that most people regard the Wacker wicket used to have. Yeah. Mm. But um, still, 162. What a fantastic innings. Absolutely. I remember going out the next morning uh, with, with Lubo, and I, I couldn't hit uh, a barn door with a banjo. And a Lubo just came down the wicket and said, you're 140 not out, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lubo. <laughs> uh, it sometimes pays just to keep it simple. Yeah. You know, yeah. none of that sort of rub, you know, rubbing the shoulders, are you all right, you know. <laughs> you know, just get on with it. Yes. Now, was there any rain in that game? Can you folks remember, was there any rain in that game? Because... Uh, the scores seem to be a little bit shy, I don't know. Like there's, you guys made 590, and you'd imagine that would be well into the second day, so the tea on the second day, maybe just after tea. Uh, we got 400, so there's two days, and then there was 199 played 197. So was, was there any delays? Can you remember? Not that I recall. Not that I recall either. I, th I think Australia yeah. batted very slowly. Yeah. Um, 134 overs, 1, 2.97, not... Yeah. Um, anyway, not to worry. Uh, Jack Richards got 100 in that as well. Yes. Um, 133. As did David Gower. Well, yes, I wasn't going to mention that, but it was one of my... Like, like you, Jess, I was very, very fond of Perth. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of run. I really enjoyed yeah. Perth. Yeah. Right. Third test we can probably overlook because that was Adelaide. Um, you have rest days in those days, I've forgotten. Um, yes. Well, the, great, the great thing at Adelaide is obviously, I mean, it's a great, great city, Adelaide, and and I, and, and actually that played a part, probably played a part in in my me being selected for tour because the previous year I'd played I'd played Sheffield Shield cricket at, at, uh, for South Australia, captain by a top man, uh, no longer um, David Hooks, and then I'd played against the hairy monster here in that in that game at, at Adelaide. And um, so, yeah, that's so gap. I remember you telling me that that season, my season in Sheffield Shield, and that mm -hmm. helped, helped me get on well, that, that trip. That was a heavy, heavily scored game, too. But uh, I think that what we didn't mention from the first, first game is that England batted first, and no one's brought it to the table. Australia won the toss and decided to bowl. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that would have been seen as maybe a bit of a defensive move by you. Did, did that give you much confidence or not? Defensive? I mean, just, just looking at tests. I mean, when I went out there, I mean, and I, I talked to people about, about the pitch at, at Brisbane, um, it's a bit like Lords. And if you play at Lords sometimes, you, you yeah. get to Lords a bit damp and you think if you get through the first hour, hour and a half, it's actually going to be really good pitch. And if you can get in and not lose too many wickets, it's fine. And so for day two, it's always the best part of the pitch. And then, you know, it starts to get up and down a bit. Um, 
it, it, I have to say, I'm glad I didn't win the toss because I wasn't sure myself what to do. So, uh, <laughs> but but you know, they say if in doubt, have a bat, or you know, rather than sort of uh, have no. a bowl. But um, I think I think AB because we had batted so badly, it was never anything else he was going to do uh, apart from bowl first on on a pitch that was going to help him, and and the fact we played so poorly. So. You can't blame AB for that, to be perfectly honest. Oh, so um, who are you blaming? The bowlers, are you? No, not at all. I'm, I'm saying we actually... You're a typical captain. You are a typical captain. <laughs> no, no. I'm saying that at long last, we, play, we, we, we actually played like we could do. And that, that's really what happened there, to be fair. You must if we had a hell of a catch, much. it might have been closer. <laughs> it would have been True. Yeah. Sure. Well, anyway, so I digress. So get to that fourth test in Melbourne. I'm sure you blokes want to talk about this one. We will. I might okay. go and have a coffee. <laughs> well, just, just quick mention about Adelaide. If we had a resto, it must have gone to Yolumba. For Rossa Valley, yeah. For Rossa Valley, yeah. We yeah. Did. yeah. Which well, is, for, the, for the guys that, that are watching it that don't know the, the setup, one of the best winery regions in the world is Barossa Valley, which is not far from Adelaide. So, of course, you would have fought hard for a, a resto so you could spend the day down there. We did. We did indeed. And if we're if the Black Opal tour is on in eighteen months' time, and let's we'll make an absolute date to spend oh, a couple of months in the Barossa. But um, <laughs> um, <laughs> those for those rest days because that that Yolumba, uh, the Hillsmith family at Yolumba, is an infamous place to be on a rest day. It's just it was just compulsory. It's where Tomo injured his shoulder. It's where Dennis Lilly and both of them got completely slaughtered um, a couple of years, a couple of tours before this one we're talking about. You kind of sort of almost forget about the cricket in Adelaide. Just save yourself for the rest day. But Gat, well played. You got a hundred there. Um, what you got? To, what you did forget though, uh, David, was that yep. Beefy was dangerous that trip for you. He wasn't even playing, remember? Because he pulled uh, it into Costal, uh, and I uh, was first change, first change bowler. We played two spinners, two seamers, yep. and myself and an extra batter. So it was very dangerous that rest day because Beefy was uh, was was off the lead, as they say. A bit playful, right? Indeed. Now, Merv, just before we move on from Adelaide, I remember yep. Merv sitting me on my ass in Adelaide with a with a snorter of a bouncer, and uh, Fat Cat Richie from mid on decided or mid off decided to have a few words in my direction. Uh, I then proceeded to go and get a, a hundred, and apparently one hundred and sixty six. No, 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 hundred and hundred and thirty sixteen or something. One hundred and sixteen, oh. yeah. And then didn't he, didn't, he get a, didn't he get a dressing down from AB in the, in the dressing room afterwards saying, you know, don't wind broad up because clearly he, he doesn't mind. <laughs> oh. but at that time, we weren't, we weren't uh, a confident um, sort of experienced side. So, you know, we had a, had a fair bit to learn. And, and Greg Ritchie, so Fat Cat, as you mentioned, he was one of the more senior players. So... Um, if you had had something to say, I, I didn't. I can't remember anything coming from Alan Border, um, but yeah, when when you say I, I sat on your backside with a bouncer, can't really recall. I didn't bowl too many bouncers in, in my career, so you think I remember them? <laughs> you know, I can't. I can't really remember uh, addressing Danny. He may have done it in private. Um, and it may have leaked out, but I, I can't recall that happening. But dude, there's every the chance it may have. Of, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, though, Merv, eh? But, <laughs> but the other thing, too, is that, that AB at that time, like, he was thrown into the captaincy and he wasn't sure about the captaincy and he, and he wanted, to, wanted to play a nice nice game of cricket. Um, so it, it could well have been that, you know, listen, just keep your mouth shut and don't. Because you went on to to get such a good score, don't don't fire these blokes up. I mean, if you gonna, it's like the old junkyard dog, you know. If you're going to bark, you've got to be able to back it up with a bite. And at, at that time, we we couldn't back up anything, so we weren't barking too much. <laughs> oh, don't believe a word of it. Um, uh -huh. Right, fourth test, Merv. You, Merv, you've specifically asked us to talk about the fourth test at the end. Oh, you know, Ripper. Um, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> in the warm up, well, was three days, wasn't it? Uh, pretty yeah, much. Three, yeah, three it didn't take that long. Um, in the warm-up to that, of course, again, infamously, the England captain uh, against Victoria. Um, I haven't actually necessarily got the chronology right here, but the England captain against Victoria was missing on the morning of the game. So uh, a former captain had to stand in and do the toss and up to what we must have bowled first. Gat, where we were you that morning? 
I, I was sadly lying in bed after a, um, uh, I had been out. I have to hold my hands up. And I'd been out to, with a friend of mine called Peter Spence, who uh, I'd uh, oh. been down in in, uh, in in Adelaide, sorry, in the, in New South Wales at Sydney with, playing for Balmain. And he had moved down to uh, Victoria. Um, he was in charge of the sort of Victoria Institute of Sport. Merv would know him quite well because I'm sure he came up through the ranks with, with Spencey. But um, sadly, one of the team that he was playing with down there, um, they went skiing and one of the families had uh, sadly, went, the, the husband had gone straight off the other side of the cliff and not come back, so to speak, sadly. So there was a, there was a function on and I said I'd go along. So I actually went along that evening before the match and uh, um, I got back uh, a little later than I wanted to. Um, phoned the wife to tell her, Spencey says hi and that, and I thought I'd put the, the receiver back down on, 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 the, uh, on the phone, but obviously it didn't go on. And I just sort of collapsed in a heap because I was tired because the Aussies had made us do about three trips backwards and forwards from Sydney yeah. already. And we were on about our 13th flight or something. So um, it was, was catching up a bit. Um, and <clears throat> so I was sleeping nicely. Um, and then all of a sudden I heard this horrible knock on the door and it was quite, so someone was breaking the door down. And it was Jess who'd come from the ground and said, do you know what time we're starting? In fact, if I remember rightly, we started half an hour earlier uh, in that match because we had to get to someone like Woodner or somewhere to play in a, in, in a match. They didn't have any landing uh, lights there. And we had to finish the match at four on the fourth day. Hang on, this is the first day, man. Yes. Yeah, but, but, but it started you, earlier you, than normal. It was half an hour yes. earlier than normal to get the, the key, so the match could finish at four o'clock on day four. I've heard some excuses before. Anyway, I was. Is it I was true or is it order. not true? You were clutching it, half a hamburger. No, it was untrue. <laughs> it was totally untrue. Didn't get down for breakfast. It was a full hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, it was. It, it was. It wasn't very good. It wasn't very good. <laughs> on to the game then. So fourth test match. We are, we need, to, if we win this game, uh, that means we keep the Ashes. Uh, Botham is back, half fit. Gladstone Small is selected. Gladys. He wasn't he selected. <laughs> that was one of those incidents where Gat, and luckily, luckily I listened to Gat for once and not going out, out in Melbourne with my ball and cricket club mates from cricket down there for the previous couple of years. Stayed, stayed put and got myself ready because uh, Gap came down to you know, the dressing room at the MCG down in the down in the, the, the down in the base. dungeon. Yeah, down in the dungeon there, at the MCG, and, and I was mixed up, again doing my twelve man my duties. You know, be, be make sure he had a large lot of shandy red and Gatorade, um, as the rest of you guys had. But um, and Gap came to get his his blazer, his England blazer. Well, he said, "Stony, Stony, stop mixing the drinks you're playing." Because again, Grand Dilly. Uh, I think he pulled a hamstring that morning, ball into Elton John in the next or something. At the end. <laughs> no, don't tell Fibs. He had a sore <laughs> knee. He was being quite honest. His knee was struggling. And yeah. So yeah. So I had within half an hour. Yeah, that's all to to sort of it. Yeah, right. I'm playing again. The, the big cauldron that the MCG is on on boxing there against against the, this this Australian side with a couple of home, homies and and Mervin and Dean Jones. There to take the battle for us. Uh, I have to say, David, when, yeah. when we won the toss and put them in, and Gladdy bowled his first three balls, two wides down the leg side, a wide down the offside, and I thought, oh my God, I've made the wrong decision because Neil Foster had given me a horrible serve as I'd sort of gone off because I said you weren't playing, and I couldn't say anything else. And so I just said to Mickey, you better have a word with Fozzie because he's really upset because. He felt he should have played because he could bat better than Stoney. And, you know, and I said, look, look, we've, sorry, I, I can't talk, Boz. I've got to go and toss up. I, I've told Stoney, <laughs> you know, and after, actually, if we, if we do win the toss, we're going to have a bowl anyway. So, you know, um, there's, there's lots to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, so it was... That, back, uh, it was... that backfired for you too, having a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> we smashed all over the park. We got to 140. <laughs> it was a great day to go. It was, you know, overcast, open weather, beefy, beefy. I mean, the guy, he, he did his in the costal a few weeks before. And he can hardly, when you do it in the costal, you can hardly breathe, far less or cough, far less more ball or cricket ball. And he was, he was, he, said, he just said, listen, I'm going to play this test match. There's no way I'm not going to play this test match. You know, we're one to look, two to play, I'm playing. Just stick whatever you need and put the thing into me. And, and he's, uh, so he was bowling about 
Daffy was niggling around. And yeah, as Gat said, the radar I wasn't quite switched on in those like open doors. I was like, hey, a bit, a bit of nerves. My first test match in Australia. They're not quite the most welcoming sorts you can get to. I, mean, I remember walking down. Gat, you sent me down towards an area in the MCG called Bay 13. Bay 13, yeah. Shouldn't have done that. What a fantastic place. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway down there, there was, there was apples and oranges and bits of <laughs> I remember picking up an apple and actually biting an apple and saying, hey, thanks guys for breakfast. You know, that's sort of just to try and count yeah. a bit. And then I think Booney, Booney sort of will nick one off me and Beefy caught on, caught to that second slip. And that got the that got me into the game and 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 relaxed and and it was a good day good day to ball that's for sure. Well, it was. You got you got David Boone, Dean Jones, Steve War, Greg Matthews, and Peter Sleep. They didn't didn't get the good players out. <laughs> no, no, Hughes, Actually, Hughes, you had to we had to leave you for Beefy. Call Richards bowled both them two. Well, when when you've got when you got two front line bowlers, thing was it five for forty and one five for forty eight. Mm. There's, a, there's a fair chance you're going to run through a team, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. To be you fair, to be again. fair, Merv, you, you must have been sitting in a change room watching Beefy bowl these pies and your batsman absolutely finding a way to get out because he didn't, he, he didn't really. I mean, if, if you'd have been, been very honest, all of us sort of sat there and thought, how on earth is he doing this? There must be some sort of hoodoo or hoodoo on these guys because they tried yeah, to hit them out that, of the ground yeah. and it was just at that time he had a huge reputation though didn't he he did he did he, he'd been, been a good player for a long time and like i suppose like uh shane Warne towards the end of his career yeah he probably got maybe a third of his wicket through who he was not how he bowled and yeah. and certainly that day he's, he was under pace but uh, ball moved a little bit um, yep. in the air too, which it doesn't really do it at Melbourne a lot. And um, me just yep. just got the nicks and to take five for forty, and, and for Gladys to take five for forty-five, you sit there and scratch your head and, and think what's going on. And the worst thing about it is that you blokes went out there and made it look so easy. <laughs> well, back well, to Jess then. Jess did. Well, <laughs> back to Jess, one hundred and twelve this time. Yeah. Well, you know, so First of all, uh, this is moving around all over the place, so I was brilliant. <laughs> failed, failed miserably with 112, didn't he? So, mate, we're out for 141. You make 349, and we get bowled out for, for 200. You, you win in, was it three days, inside three days? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Gladstone got some runs as well, Merv. Glad he got some runs to the end. A very important 21. Not oh, out. Yeah, no. Yeah. And actually, the question came in from one of our one of our one of our mates, one of our travelling mates, Ad Ad Osinki, um, asking about because about um, Mer Mervin's contribution, particularly with the I think with the very last ball of the match, Phil Phil Edmonds, Hen Henry Edmonds was was ball, and Henry used to get quite bored at times, and he could be quite destructive, couldn't he, Gap? And, he, and I, I was on the sweep. I was on the on the, on the sweep. And he moved me, he kept telling me to move down the square and move down the square. And he said, put an X down, put an X down, because you fellas like dancing around and moving about. Put an X down. So I put his X down, and the very next ball, he played the one up to you, Merv. You had your, your customary hike towards, towards mid-wicket, mid and it dragged it over my way. And it was a steepling, this ball steepling out of the sky. And I took the catch. And when I took the catch, I looked down, I was standing directly above the X where Phil Edmonds told me, told me to make. And then I well, threw the ball away. Well, as, as a batsman, well, as a fine batsman I was, I have a look where you are and think, gee, I've got to be stiff to hit it to him. <laughs> he didn't have to move. So how good a shot was it? <laughs> oh, but then, where, where you guys had your watershed moment at, at that first test with that talk with Beefy, we had the watershed moment that night after that game. Um, Alan Borden, and you might remember the Davis Cup was on. Yeah, it and was, yeah. Pat, Pat Cash came from, I reckon, two sets down in the last leg to win it, to win it for Australia. And we're sitting in the rooms cheering. Very lonely. That's amazing. It's a very lonely place when you lose a test match, your yeah. rooms. But when you win, you can't move. Everyone's there. So we were in there watching. And, and a few of you guys might have hung around, but probably off celebrating. But 
when it happened, Bob Hawke, our then Prime Minister, got up and presented it and said, oh, you know, Pat Cash, what a, what a fantastic effort. If only we had had 10 Pat Cashes at the MC, or 11 Pat Cashes at the MCG today. And I remember Alan Board had his beer in his hand and he just threw it and he's just stood up. I've had a gut full of this crap, right? I would, I would rather lose games than being seen as an absolute prick. I'm, at the moment, I'm seen as a nice guy and we're losing. And from, from that moment, our attitude to cricket changed and Alan Border's attitude as Australian captain changed. So that was our watershed moment. And it worked. It certainly worked for him and for the team. Um, oh, yeah. We're running, we're running short of time now. First of all, that, that celebration... When, when are we going to talk about 89, David? Uh, in the next one, can you, can you make it again next week, Mo? <laughs> uh, and can I probably and I'll I'll get someone else to interview you then, okay? That'll be because <laughs> I'm I'm still in therapy from that year. Um, right. So we had the celebrations in Melbourne at the end of that game of three nights with Elton John. Let's just not forget Elton, who had been on tour in Australia at the same time, had had a problem with his uh, nodules on his voice box, um, which is not a euphemism and was turned into an England cricket groupie. So we had celebrations with the champagne supplied by Mr. Elton John. Uh, he was looking very dapper. Everyone in the England dressing room wearing their sort of shorts and t-shirts as uh, normally. In fact, here we have it. There it is. Here we have <laughs> silk, <laughs> a silk suit. Look at that. Look at that. I've no idea who that bloke on the left is. He's far too slim. Uh, <laughs> Must have, must have, must have changed the aspect of the photograph. But there he was, EJ, um, as happy as anyone to be part of it. Uh, we were very happy to see him. Uh, and that left us uh, two and up, one to play, although we lost in Sydney. Um, but we kept the ashes, which is the key. Now, um, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to try and get a few questions in. Uh, Merv, quick one for you somewhere. Um, just recent, recent gossip. Um, and this comes from George Riley. Um, Greg Chappell recently suggested yeah. that certain forms of ball tampering should be legalised. One or two, in fact, I think it was Ian Chappell rather more than Greg, but whichever Chappell it was or both of them. Um, obviously with restrictions on saliva and the whole thing as and when the game ever starts again. Uh, thoughts please, both from Murph Hughes first as a bowler and then um, Mr Broad as a, a match official. Um, well, well, at the moment the, the rule's pretty clear, isn't it? Um, and there's, there's been talk of, of players using lozenges, of players using um, sunscreen and, and whatever. Um, and now the talk is that you're not going to be able to use saliva. Um, if there's no saliva, you can still use your perspiration. But um, I, mate, the rules are the rules. And I, I, I'm, I'm all, always one for if you don't make the rules, you follow the rules. Okay, so... If they come out and say, right, we're going to open ball tampering up, it's going to be fair for, for everyone. But at the moment, the way the rules are seen, all the players know what's allowed and what's not allowed. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can push it to the nth degree, but you push the rules, you don't break the rules, David. And, and as a bowler, um, you know, there's, there's been a bit of it going on more recently, but what we've got to do is have an even playing field is that you can't have um, sides doing what they want to do. And you know, like in, in South Africa, Faf, and he's, he's been done twice for ball tampering and had a slap on the wrist both times. I think he got a one or two game suspension yeah. where yeah. as an Australian player, if you do it, you get 12 months. It's not a level playing field, is it? So what the ICC have to do and have done is they've got more serious about ball tampering. So... Yeah. Yeah. If guys, if the rules are there, if guys are caught ball tampering, you don't slap them on the wrist. You, you kick them in the butt and give them an extended suspension so you stop it from happening in the game. Okay. And Jess? Very good. Um, to be fair, um, the two uh, incidents you're talking about there with uh, Faf Duplessis and, and your Aussie boys, it was the Cricket Australia, oh, the 12-month ban on the, on the players, not the ICC. The, the, uh, the ICC code of conduct can only, uh, well, I mean, there is an eight-match ban that they can um, impose on people if they uh, do things seriously wrong. Um, but, you know, a 12-month ban is a restraint of trade. But, you know, because Cricket Australia have 
contracts with the players, they are able to take that contract yeah. away for a period of time. So uh, as far as the ICC is concerned and, and restarting cricket again, it's, it's a big discussion at the moment. And I am not in favour of opening up ball tampering. I think it would be dangerous. I think it's, uh, it would open up a massive can of worms. I would like to see umpires in control of any uh, polishing of the ball, maybe, maybe allowing some kind of um, substance to be used, but in their possession. Uh, but I can't see that any, if you're not going to allow bowlers to use sweat or, or spit to shine the ball, uh, you know, that's, a, that's another thing. Naturally, bowlers are going to, you know, lick their yeah. fingers and put it on the ball. So how to stop them doing that is going to be a difficult one. Um, and, you know, if it's going to be starting up in, in this country, you know, sooner rather than later, maybe July, August, uh, you know, it's, it, there are going to have to be rules and regulations brought yeah. into play fairly quickly to, and, and, and to monitor the situation. What, what about a rule? Sorry, Gladys. What about a rule to come in that the bowler is the only person on the ground that can shine the ball? Because at the moment we've got designated shiners and and the ball get the ball back to the bowler. He can shine it when he gets to the top of his mark. He runs in and bowls. I'm I'm sick of watching cricket where the bowler is standing at the top of his mark waiting to receive the ball from the bloke at mid on or mid off or cover because he's sitting there shining it. And then, Just, and then you're limiting the number of people who put their hands on the ball, the ball. and mm. passing any exactly. around. I think that's a very sensible suggestion. That, that was going to be my Thank you. But bowling is, is a, just like batting, who twiddle the bats or do shine just by getting the ball in your hand and shining it. Or it's a natural thing. It's a natural reflex action that bowlers bowlers do. So it will be very very hard thing to instill install. Say it to a bowler not to shine the ball. Yeah. Okay. Right. A few more questions here, just to try and rush through. Um, let's have a look. One one involves Merv. We've got a hat trick against West Indies at the Wacker. Glad. Did you ever get an international hat trick playing for England? Never got. A, I never got a first class hat trick. Well, there you go. Um, the other thing, Glad, from Nicholas Lindsay. All those bats behind. You on your wall. Well, have a, have a look at that bat right behind him. I reckon that's the bat he used for the last five years of his career. Not a red mark on it. <laughs> Little mini ones. That's what I was I used against you, man. Uh, we've got one here from Merv Ramsey. Mervyn Ramsey in the Lord's Taverners. Would George Shooter have outdrunk Beefy? Now, there's a contest I'd like to hear the result Ooh. of, but not like to be present for, because that would just be ugly. That will um, be ugly. Uh, they've, they've, they've both had a couple in their time, that's for sure. Um, and Merv Hughes, maybe. Then. Um, Not in their way. Manillos, Spanish cricket wants to know what's the view around the table about restarting cricket in the COVID crisis. Slip fielders two metres apart, uh, no fisting of gloves after smashing that six over square leg. Thoughts, please, very quickly go to Michael Gatting. Yeah, I, I think uh, it'd be nice to, nice to get some cricket underway. Uh, I think generally we're, most of the fielders apart from the slips are, are social distancing, but if they do play, they'll all have been tested. Uh, they'll all be out there. Uh, nobody should have it. So um, the only, only thing is, is is saliva on the ball, how you do that. And they will do, hopefully, the most simple thing that they can find to do to make it easy for everybody. Uh, and we should get on and start playing some cricket. Uh, well, it could be a while yet, of course, as we know. How long is a piece of string? No one knows the answer to that one. Um, do we know any good stories about Graham Gooch? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we do, of course, you do. A very, very, let's say, for the record, an extraordinarily fine player. Um, we'll save that for, for, the, for our next one on the 1991 tour of Australia. We can talk about Tiger Moss and all sorts. Um, Ed Demora Correa wants to know the future of Test Match Cricket because of the competition uh, from other formats, um, which to some people are more attractive. In this case, he says commercially more attractive. So can we have a quick quick um, shout out for the survival of Test Cricket, please, Merv? Uh, well, quite honestly, Test, test Cricket is struggling because there's only two countries that actively promote Test Cricket, and that's Australia and England. Um, so what we've got to do is get the other countries on board and make, make Test Cricket the number one priority. At the moment, I think it's slipping a bit. Uh, the one day of the 2020, and I think 
in society now, everything, everyone wants everything condensed. So they don't want to go and watch a five-day test match. They'd rather go and watch a, a three-hour 2020 game. Get with it. It's a game of cricket. Indeed. Well, actually, I could not have put that better. That is succinct, it's to the point, and it's absolutely right. Uh, Jess, quick question for you, though. Simon Wilde of the Sunday Times, just sort of saving a bit of time here. Uh, it'll be in the paper this weekend, no doubt. Uh, what, are, what are the prospects for work? What are going to be the rules for match referees as and when cricket starts up again? You won't be travelling. Well, uh, as I suggested a little earlier, you know, there is a lot of moments over at uh, headquarters in Dubai and amongst uh, uh, match referees and not that we've been involved massively in it at this moment in time but there is discussion about how the game of cricket will start again and what uh, playing conditions and, and rules and regulations will be brought in to make sure that players are safe. Uh, the one thing I, I do know is that, that most of the games that start uh, in the foreseeable future will be at an empty stadiums. And I think, you know, not only cricket, but football has been talking about that. And I'm sure all spectator sports will be uh, without spectators at the start until we can get a, um, uh, this virus under control and, and get it cured. Uh, because there is no safety in groups coming to or, or necessarily play sport until we have a vaccine. Okay, well, on that note, um, as I said, I think time is, time is against us. Um, thank you very much indeed to all of you for your time uh, this afternoon in the UK, early morning in Melbourne. And Merv, you're looking very, very well on it. Indeed. Um, and thank you for all of you to wear, for wearing your comedy beards. Um, <laughs> outstanding. Um, good luck to you all. Uh, thank you, I say. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on behalf of Black Opal and the Lord's Taverners who have joined forces on this occasion to get us to talk about 86, 87. I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities to talk again about other tours, about other memories. Merv, if you're free again, it's been great to have you with us. We'd love to have you back. Now you've yeah, 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 yeah. That'll be great stuff. But uh, to Mike, to Jess, to Glad again, uh, congratulations on everything from 86, 87. Thanks for your time this afternoon and to all of you. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon.